Good morning and a warm welcome to the 23rd meeting of the Constitution Europe External Affairs and Culture Committee in 2024. Our first agenda item is a decision to taking business in private. Are members content to take items three and four in private? Okay. Thank you very much. Our second agenda item is to take evidence on climate justice with a specific focus on the Scottish Government's Climate Justice Fund in advance of COP29 next month. And this morning, we are joined by Professor Tassine Jaffrey, Director of the Mary Robinson Centre for Climate Justice at Glasgow Caledonian University, Ben Wilson, Director of Public Engagement at the Scottish Catholic Interna International Aid Fund, SCIAF, and Bridget Burns, Executive Director of Women's Environment and Development Organisation, who is joining us stateside in the very early hours of the morning, I believe. So um, thank you for joining with us this morning, uh, Bridget. Um, if I could open with a couple of questions and then we'll move to questions from the members. But um, what are your expectations of COP29 and which aspects should the Scottish Government be pri prioritising in Baku? And perhaps if I could start with you, Professor Jaffrey. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, very good morning. Um, I think COP29 is going to be... Um, an interesting one in that it tallies over from the outputs of COP28. Uh, I think the things to look out for at this COP is the new collective goal on climate finance, um, and it's the cornerstone of the developed countries' commitment to um, supporting both mitigation and adaptation, um, and indeed uh, by way of supporting uh, national uh, country plans and the delivery of NDCs. Uh, COP29 will also be focusing on the global goal on adaptation and there will be no doubt um, scrutiny around the loss and damage fund. I think um, from the Scottish Government's perspective, I think it's really important that um, um, the focus be on how the Scottish Government can contribute and um, play a, a pivotal role in the, these new collective goals on finance and where its financial commitment uh, through climate justice and its funding uh, aligns uh, clearly and squarely with the bigger the big agendas which is what cop this this is a finance cop and there will be all eyes on on how these funding sources will be supported and and delivered on on the ground thank you Mr. Wilson. Thank you and, and good morning, everyone. Yeah, I would agree with Professor Jaffrey about the, the new collective quantified goal being absolutely the priority of this COP. It's going to be the finance COP. That's what's going to dominate all the headlines. Um, a quick summary on that. I mean, you'll know that there was a, this 100 billion a year target um, set all the way back in 2009 for um, developed countries to give to developing countries to help them to, to adapt to um, uh, z net zero economies and also to adapt to the impacts of climate change. Um, that's now expired and by 2025 there needs to be a new goal. There'll be a huge conflict over the quantum of that. So we've already seen a conflict at the pre-COP negotiations in Bonn, which happened in June, um, where some countries uh, in the Global South put forward a target of between one trillion and 1.3 trillion um, dollars for climate finance annually as part of this new collective quantified goal. The Global North countries at those negotiations did not yet uh, mention any target whatsoever. There needs to be a target achieved at COP29. It's going to be a big conflict there. Like Professor Jaffrey said, the issue of loss and damage closely relates to this one and, and will be something that's closely um, talked about and scrutinised as well at, at COP29. Um, and obviously the Scottish Government have a particular reputation and expertise on loss and damage and therefore I think their um, most strategic um, thing to focus on at COP29 would probably be to um, emphasise the need for that new collective quantified goal target to have a sub-goal for loss and damage. That's not a gimme. So there's a lot of Global North countries who are arguing that that new goal should only focus on mitigation, reducing emissions, and adaptation, but not loss and damage. 
Um, the reason for that is that there's many countries in the Global North who are still um, not entirely satisfied um, with the progress that's been made on the issue of loss and damage in recent years, and therefore they'll see this as another opportunity to actually, and, and to some extent, go back on, on those commitments that have been made on, on that issue. So I think that would be the, a, a real strategic priority for, loss and, uh, for the Scottish Government to focus on. And just lastly, I would, I would say that in terms of the Scottish Government's presence there, Obviously, we know that they're not a party to the negotiations, and whilst it's really important that um, they have positions on the negotiations and, and therefore are able to comment on them and use their soft power in such a way, there's also other value to the Scottish Government being there that's not just about the negotiations. The, the role that, and the activities they can engage in with civil society and with other sub-state actors, um, with, with other researchers and experts um, in terms of building up a uh, deepening understanding, be it on loss and damage or indeed on, on renewables or, or the journey to net zero. Those are valuable things that happen too at a COP, um, and I would hope the Scottish Government would be engaging in, in activities like that as well as following the formal negotiations. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms Burns? Good morning, all. Can I just check that you can hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. I, I, I know we already checked it, but I always want to double check. Um, thank you so much for having me. And, and it's wonderful to be able to build off of uh, my fellow colleagues who um, who just joined. I think, you know, it has already been said in terms of the critical importance of this COP around finance, um, this being, uh, as we've, we've heard, the year of finance. And maybe just to say, as um, my organization is part of, of a constituency called the Women and Gender Constituency, bringing in particular women's rights and gender equality uh, views into the climate change space and into the climate change negotiations alongside broad social justice asks. And so all of the points that Ben in particular just raised around what we really want to see um, out of the discussions on a new collective quantified goal. And certainly I do think Scottish leadership on ensuring loss and damage is not lost in the conversations around that and is uh, made a, a sub goal of those, of those discussions feels like a very key entry point. Um, it's also the quality of how we're speaking about climate finance. We've been advocating for an ambitious science and needs based goal um, that really will deliver for people, particularly at the front lines. Um, and we know that that requires significantly enhancing and simplifying direct access to grants-based finance for marginalized and disenfranchised groups and really centering human rights and gender equality um, in climate finance itself. So that, that means advocacy that, advocacy that we are doing in terms of the, the decisions themselves uh, and what is contained in them and, and the narrative that we have around what climate finance looks like. Um, I think another critical point is while this is also the year, while this is the year of finance, um, one other element that is on the agenda at this upcoming COP is a renewal of the gender action plan, which is one of several drivers, uh, we believe, under the UN Climate Convention that really is about um, centering climate justice and how do we, across uh, all of the actions that we take, ensure that we are thinking about intersectional human rights and gender equality issues. Um, there's not a huge amount of attention being paid to this, and there's quite a bit of, uh, of challenges in terms of ensuring that we get a strong outcome on, under the Gender Action Plan at this upcoming COP, um, including from across a range of parties, simply upholding really important uh, agreed language around human rights and gender equality that have been achieved, but actually using this as an opportunity uh, to showcase uh, what gender just climate solutions look like and to move the needle on why this action plan should be a driver for more sustainable and just uh, climate finance, mitigation, adaptation, and, and loss and damage. Um, and I think, as was mentioned before, we've had really incredible experiences working with the Scottish government in that um, soft power role, if you will, of really highlighting uh, the understanding of, for example, the critical need for any transition away from fossil fuels to be grounded in justice and, and the challenges that come with that. Um, but there are so many wonderful examples that the Scottish government is leading on at home that I think provide an incredible model for uh, other countries. And we've had really good partnerships and uh, events that we've done where we've been able to share collectively 
what that vision could look like. So just wanted to emphasize that point as well. Thank you. Thank you. I've got quick questions for all of you. If I could, I, I could direct questions. Uh, Professor Jaffrey, you mentioned in your submission the uh, role of climate finance in Ghana. I wonder if you could just expand on what's happening there and, and, and why that's um, of particular importance. The, the example that I gave in the evidence there, that's through um, doctoral research that was conducted um, with myself and um, uh, my student at the time, who is now a senior uh, climate uh, expert at the UNDP in Ghana. Essentially, what that research was looking at was the flow of finance into countries. The reason Ghana was chosen, because that was the, the, the country of origin of where the research and, and um, my student was based. But trying to get into the depths of finance architecture um, is what, what the research was about. And to, 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 to strip it right back, what we actually discovered was the very, very small percentage of the finance that reaches a country like Ghana um, and the percentage that actually gets to those who need it the most, those who are the poorest and the most vulnerable. Um, and it is incredible um, that that happens. I think a lot of the finance gets stuck through um, uh, processes, procedures, uh, administration, uh, things, like, things like that. But on top of that, there's very little by way of accountability, uh, transparency and uh, transferability. And there, is, there seems to be no mechanism to track the impact that, that even that small percentage of finance is making to those who need it the most. The, the methodology, the architecture, the reporting requirements just don't seem to be there. And there seems to be a flaw right through the, the architecture of how finance flows. And so it, it refers back to the point that I'd made earlier on in terms of the new collective goal on climate finance and how this relates to the Scottish Government's loss and damage funding. Loss and damage funding is indeed a voluntary aspect. And I think when, when we're looking at the considerable volumes of money that are gone in, I think when we look at it totally, it's, it's around 20, uh, it's about 40 million. I think what's really important is that we really understand the impact that that funding has made on the ground and really um, knowing what our indicators of impact are, what difference it has made, and getting a robust and consolidated narrative, because that narrative, I feel, is really important to be able to influence other uh, stakeholders around the UNFCCC negotiations. Thank you. Uh, and Mr Wilson, you, you mentioned the Soft Power Act aspect of what's happening. Um, how, um, how is the Scottish Government promoting its own um, stance on loss and damage and what other countries are coming in behind that? And what, what benefit do you think they, them being there and, and what influence can they give in that at COP29? Sure. Um, I mean, just, just quickly refer, uh, reflecting back on COP26, I mean, obviously, the Scottish Government had a very, very high uh, uh, prominence there at COP26, it being in Glasgow, and, and most of the delegates coming being aware of the constitutional situation here in relation to the UK Government and, and being aware that it was a UK Government-run COP. And I think the Scottish Government, um, uh, frankly, um, played, played, uh, their, uh, played their cards very, very well at COP26 and championing that issue uh, um, because it was, a, yeah, it was a very strategic way to use the, the prominence that they had at the conference to, to be the first to, to champion and to put money behind loss and damage from the Global North in a way that, um, that precipitated more action which followed. And I think that you know, whilst obviously the Scottish Government can't take uh, all the credit for, for the progress which has subsequently been, been made on loss and damage, certainly not, I think most experts on this issue would agree that they did have a very significant role indeed by making that commitment at 
at COP26. I think since then, obviously, uh, the further and further we've got away from, from Glasgow and the more and more progress has been made on loss and damage at the international level, of course, many more eyes are now on the likes of, of China and the US and the EU and everyone else with regards to what they will do on loss and damage. But people still remember that the Scottish Government were the first movers on this and, the, and they still have a, a, a great um, presence in speaking on these issues at the big international events. Some of the, well, there's two, maybe there's two ways I can say that they've really been um, taking that message internationally. Some has been through the policy, uh, at, at the policy level, and that's been through convening events. So, for example, there was an event in Edinburgh a few months ago now that the Scottish Government hosted together with the Slycan Trust, which was looking at, in particular, community access, direct access to that UN loss and damage fund. Um, that's something that many people are calling for. Um, and this event was about getting experts together in the room with Scottish Government, with experts to reflect on some proposals to put forward to the Loss and Damage Fund Board on how a community fund like that could operate. Um, so they do events like that and they will be hosting dialogues at COP29, which will help draw out some of the lessons from the Scottish Government funded programmes on loss and damage that have already taken place. I, I met with officials yesterday and were talk was talking about one such event when we'll get partners from Malawi, from Zambia, from Bangladesh uh, and elsewhere to, to share learnings. But then there's the political side, and I think it was really the political side of things, the political um, will behind the initial commitment from Scottish Government on loss and damage that, that helped make such a splash there. Uh, and I would hope and expect that what, uh, whoever, whichever minister um, for the Scottish Government is attending COP29, that they'll be able to use platforms um, to, to raise some of the points on the negotiations that are raised earlier. Uh, and I think because of the, the, the great um, presence the Scottish Government have on this issue, that it, it, it will be listened to and, and they will be heard clearly. Um, some of the platforms there, and I'll just conclude on this, are amongst the, the small state actor groups. So the Scottish Government have a leadership role both in the Regions 4 coalition and in the Under 2 coalition. And through those spaces, they're able to get platforms to, to make some of those commitments, uh, some of those uh, comments on the negotiations, which would hopefully have a political impact. OK, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Ms Burns, if I, I could ask you, um, I, um, years ago, read a book by Mar Marilyn Waring called If Women Counted, which challenged the sort of financial and economic outlook about what counted as work. So the example I remember from that is that um, a commute to work was considered economic activity, but uh, collecting water uh, for a family from a well was not. Um, so I just wanted to ask you if, if you... If you're confident that the evaluations that will happen as a result of the, you know, something um, that is completely focused on finance will reflect the impact and, and the duties that are recognised that are, are gendered in, in relation to caring duties and um, all those kind of activities, or, or do you have concerns that there will be a bias in what is, is being evaluated? Thank you. I, I love that question. Um, I'm not at all confident. I don't think that this aspect uh, of um, uh, what counts in terms of finance to the perspective of thinking about um, a, a care economy, for example, is what we will see as discussions under the new collective quantified goal on finance. I think, unfortunately, you know, those discussions and those negotiations are in such a political space at the moment, as Ben has had talked about in terms of um, how far apart countries are on the overall quantum. Part of our concern is that we lose the nuance of the, uh, uh, the challenges that we have in the current finance mechanisms that we engage in quite heavily around the Green Climate Fund and the oper operationalization of the Loss and Damage Fund and the recognition that even if we have the money flowing into these mechanisms, they're really not necessarily reaching the front lines, not re necessarily reaching the groups that most need those resources um, because they are not really shifting the way that they're thinking about what counts and what's important. And there's a lot of barriers, um, even in the system themselves. And we, we speak a lot with countries about their role in helping us shift our understandings of what mitigation adaptation and loss and damage look like, what an assessment of risk really means, um, because in these climate mechanisms, we're often um, and we're finding that folks 
are valuing risk higher to invest, for example, in programs that support women's livelihoods than in large scale infrastructure programs, because this is what people think of as climate action. And so one of the things that we've worked with the Scottish government around is centering this understanding of just transition through a program that we run called Gender Just Climate Solutions, which is about lifting up the community-based solutions to adaptation, mitigation, loss and damage that are either capacity strengthening or um, focused on community-based renewable energy systems and understanding the barriers that these have to scale. And it is often about changing the nature of what needs to be invested in. Um, and it's not just, for example, um, shifting energy systems within a community or in a country, but really understanding what is currently undervalued, where do we not have the resources to be able to invest in healthcare infrastructure, in education infrastructure, and seeing that as part of the quote unquote green transition as well. The thing I am confident about and why I linked already to the gender action plan, to the work on, uh, there's a work under a work program, a new newly established work program under the UN Climate Change Convention around just transition. The thing I am, that gives me hope and optimism and where I really do see Scotland as having an opportunity to be a strong voice um, and, and a political power in the space is it does feel like the global community has started to shift from a conversation about should we shift away from fossil fuels to we must and how do we ensure that transition should be just um, and how do we understand, for example, uh, a, a shift to a uh, a care economy, a shift away from harm to care. And I find in our spaces that through things like the Gender Action Plan, we're able to have these more substantive discussions about what it looks like to have this shift in community. Uh, and it's why these other aspects of the climate negotiations are really important so that we're embedding social and climate justice. And it's it's certainly an area that we've found uh, uh, the ability to partner with Scotland and local governments um, and municipalities uh, has been really important to give voice and visibility to how folks are trying to, to grapple with a just transition. Thank you very much. I'm going to move to questions from the committee and I'll bring in Mr Stewart first, please. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. You already said that the Scottish Government do have a part to play when it comes to uh, the COP, uh, and that's about access, that's about understanding, but there is also the potential conflict. Uh, when it comes to, because Scotland continues to have a role within the, uh, the climate voice and it leads that campaign in some ways, but it's also failing to manage to do its own targets here. And that creates uh, a situation and circumstance when it comes to sort of sustainability uh, and, and credibility as to where we are. So it would be good to get a view from you where you think uh, that fits uh, when you're talking about the sustainability of the current levels of spend and climate justice itself. Thank you. I, I think uh, I think that's a, a, a perfectly uh, great question, and um, this issue of credibility w will come up in terms of Scottish government missing its target. Um, I think um, I think what's important here is um, is taking stock of what we've achieved so far, focusing on the positives. Although the whole picture seems very very negative, I think to to try and to make sense of it. Um, how much Scotland has achieved in relation to other nation states in reaching uh, the targets thus far. I think um, Scotland um, and the Scottish Government do have a, a strong voice and they have championed climate justice since Paris when the term was first uh, kind of like coined. Um, I think there's an opportunity here to connect the issue of climate justice and just transition, both domestically and internationally. Um, I think to try and move forward in this place in scope is to perhaps look at a whole of society approach where the Scottish Government is seen to be taking society with them on this journey to, to net zero. Um, rather than the traditional leave no one behind, it's a purposeful, <coughs> meaningful direction of travel. Um, and there is a role to play for the Scottish Government in how it looks at things domestically, because when you look at climate justice on the bigger scale of things, it's about supporting those who are in 
the poorest countries, Global South. That's where the whole mantra comes from. But the way our climate is changing, those who have contributed least in the Global North are at the front line as well. And we're seeing that all over. In Scotland here, the US, you've seen all, all the reports. So I, I'm, I'm wondering whether there is a, a, a way in which the Scottish Government can, can pivot somehow its championing of climate justice uh, domestically and try and bring these arguments together to show that we are really committed to this at home and, and overseas. Um, and I think it will be really important when we look at this business of uh, just transition, a fair and just transition. It's not just the journey away, journey, it's not just the journey to net zero, but it's looking at how we do it in a manner that's fair and equitable. And unpacking that will be a critical part of this, I think. Thank you. Mr Wilson? Um, I think you make a very good point, um, and I think it's a really important one, and it's frankly something that does at times make me feel uncomfortable because um, as, as SCIAF and as a member of Stop Climate Chaos Scotland, we have both campaigned for the Scottish Government to have a, a very um, a positive stance on climate justice and have the Climate Justice Fund and make the commitment to loss and damage, but also, of course, to, to set bold targets and then to achieve bold targets, and they've not achieved those bold targets, and that uh, is a great deal of concern. I think the reality is, is that the more targets that are missed in Scotland, then the more loss and damage that will be caused overseas, uh, and probably uh, to the tune of many more millions than the Scottish Government have actually pledged to it. And I think it is therefore something that absolutely needs to be addressed. I think one thing that the Scottish Government could do uh, in terms of their international credibility on this is to be honest about the failings that have led to Scotland to miss its targets, to go to COP29 with that, maybe it's too soon now, but to go to COP29 with a document that says, this is what we got wrong, we are taking it really seriously, uh, and this is how we're going to address it. Um, thus far, as, it's my understanding that ministers have not done that yet. Um, recently, when ministers had to respond uh, to the, the, the missed targets, um, which have most recently been reported, which I think makes it now is it nine out of 13 targets that have been missed, um, it was basically a rehashed uh, 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 number of policies which had already been announced before about how they were going to get there. Um, so basically, what I think if Scottish Government were to go to own it, to be upfront and honest, but to say we are committed to being as bold and as as ambitious as possible. We're still committed to net zero 2045, and this is how we're going to do it, both in terms of policy, but also in terms of the overall governance of, of achieving these climate targets, then that might um, go some way towards improving their, their potentially damaged credibility um, on this issue. But, I mean, I would just really reaffirm what, what Professor Jaffrey said here. I think that from the public point of view, it's really important both that um, this, the, the failure of Scotland to reach its targets and, and subsequently, therefore, to change the law um, should not I, it would be really dangerous if the public saw that uh, as if achieving uh, climate just targets is unachievable. It's not unachievable. It could have been achieved if the right things were put in place at the right time, and they weren't. Um, and so I think we, we need to see um, a clear pathway towards the bold targets that will be set in the new law, but also that sense of, of optimism that actually delivering net zero is not just good for the climate, it's not just good for the countries where SCIAF works, it's also good for people here in Scotland, um, it's good for, for people in cities, it's good for people um, who want to take more public transport, it's good for our air quality and, and all of that. And I think that it'd be really good to hear that message coming strongly from ministers. Thank you. <clears throat> and Ms Burns? Yes, I, thank you for the question. I, I, I agree with everything that has been said, and I think it's really important not to underestimate um, the importance of the what Scotland has already done in terms of its political leadership on climate justice in the global landscape and, to, and how important that leadership has been, both in terms of moving the needle on loss and damage, as well as the work in creating the Climate Justice Fund. Um, it is in the scheme of, of where we are in the global landscape, countries are pushing and moving towards that. And so I think that the way that you match that with what is happening domestically is exactly what has been said here, is a willingness to engage in the fact that transitioning our social systems and our economies when done with intention, when thinking about justice, are not often easily achievable. And being humble with those learnings, I think, is, is a gift to the global community, because there are many countries that are not um, at the same level of, of 
being kind of overall accepting that we need to transition away from fossil fuels. And so when we look in the in the grand scheme of of where folks are, I still think that that Scotland has a lot to offer uh, the global community in terms of where it's at with trying to meet its targets and ambitioning and pushing towards its targets, as well as <clears throat> is humility and honesty in the challenges in actually being able to do that. So following on from that, how, how do you think we should be then monitoring and evaluating uh, the, the, the Scottish Government's climate justice projects that we already have? Uh, because these projects are, are receiving funding uh, and have got support, uh, and many are achieving uh, a reasonable balanced approach, but they're not necessarily getting over the line uh, in what they're trying to achieve and what they're trying to evaluate. So what, hap what needs to happen next? Uh, it, this COP is all about finance, and we've already said that, but it's not just the finance that's required, it's the momentum, uh, and it's how that is evaluated and how that is monitored uh, that will give an indication of what is needed for the future, because the data that is, is given and transmitted will give us an understanding of where we are, but at the same time, we have to have some way of evaluating that and monitoring what will happen, because if we don't, we just continue to fall behind uh, and we don't actually progress. Uh, thank you, Professor Jack. Uh, start on that, that question. Um, I think it's a really important point to to raise at this uh, at this committee, and, and also to take stock of the, the the volume of funds that have gone in, and really understanding the benefits that that level of funding has made on the ground. So, if I could strip it back very very quickly to um, how we monitor and evaluate, I think what's really important here is we get. The, the story correct. We we get the, the 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 baseline around what it is that we want to achieve here. What is the purpose of all of this collective uh, funding that's gone in through these various avenues, through um, uh, advocacy, through humanitarian assistance, through uh, climate just communities, and so on. I think the, there are so many different uh, moving pots and parts to this. And it's important to get a baseline, a collective vision of what, where it all sits. And from there, um, we understand that the research and evidence is currently lacking in terms of monitoring and evaluation. And I have to say, it's not just about monitoring and evaluation, but it's about impact further downstream that will be uh, more sustainable post uh, the funding coming to an end. Um, and uh, to develop those um, met metrics and those indicators, I think they're not there yet, as far as I can understand. I haven't looked into it in, in any great detail, but from what I do know from the outside looking in, I haven't seen anything um, that will help me to, to articulate what the collective goal for all of this is. So I think it's really important that that, that is, is done now, because that in itself will shape the very, very strong narrative that the Scottish Government need to be able to position itself on the global stage and influence others to be part of the journey with them. And it goes back to the loss and damage funding, which is voluntary in nature. Um, how do you convince other donors to voluntarily put into that loss and damage pot um, over and above the new collective goal on climate finance? So it's, it's a big subject, but I hope that's summarised yeah. a little Thank bit. you. Mr Wilson. Um, yes, I very much agree with Professor Jaffrey. I think that, I mean, looking back in, in the papers for this meeting as well, um, reflecting that the last time a, a thorough review was done of Scotland's Climate Justice Fund was, was 2021, and obviously you don't want to do these things too frequently, but I would, I would suggest that after um, the projects funded in this parliament um, have concluded that another comprehensive review um, of the Climate Justice Fund, considering all of the various different projects that have been funded, would be a, a good thing to do to, to extract some of the learnings that Professor Jaffrey is talking about, um, which cut across different pieces of, of the funding which go to different agencies. I mean, speaking on behalf of SCIAF, so we, we've received um, £800,000 from the Climate Justice Fund this year for loss and damage work, and we're implementing the £8 million 
grant in Rwanda as part of climate just communities. So, you know, we do our own evaluations uh, at the moment, our own monitoring and evaluation, uh, and uh, write our own concluding reports uh, when projects come to an end. And we do engage closely with other recipients of climate just uh, climate justice funding. Um, but I think. Uh, that, that at the moment has been uh, encouraged by the Scottish Government, but still relatively, I suppose, um, ad hoc and, and loose in terms of what that collaboration with the other grant holders looks like. So a comprehensive review would be good. But, but if I may also say that I think um, meetings like this are good and further scrutiny from Parliament is, is good and very much um, well received. Um, the, the, there was recently published a contribution to development report by the Scottish Government, which includes a summary of, of all of the Scottish Government's international development spending. As far as I'm aware, that wasn't accompanied by a debate. I'm not sure if that's been scrutinised, that report, by this committee or not. But as much as possible, I think, whilst the, the levels of funding going from Scotland to international development and climate justice might be relatively small compared to some other budget lines, it is very important work in terms of Scotland's uh, international reputation and and we would certainly very much welcome increased parliamentary scrutiny of the spending as well in terms of good practice and, and, and improving the quality and the transparency of all of this work. Thank you. And Ms Barnes? Yeah, I think that, you know, for us, one of the major indicators of, of moving the needle towards climate justice is about those resources actually getting to the front lines. It's about the projects that are being invested in, not just about the communities that are involved in those projects, but they're actually ceding community control over resources, over choices, over climate and sustainable um, energy systems. And, and a lot of that, again, is about where and how the money is being channeled. As, as Professor Jeffrey said, so some of the challenges that we have in broad scale climate finance as a whole is when you start to drill down at where that money has gone, you know, less than 1%, less than 3% is reaching the communities that it needs to reach. And so I think one of the ways this analysis um, can be done is by understanding how the mechanisms that Scotland's been working through and creating through the Climate Justice Fund, the impact that that has been having in reaching um, communities at the front lines of these impacts and what the sustainability of those projects is, uh, what it has been and what it is. It's certainly in the work that we've done with the Scottish Government, as has just been said, that's one of the key indicators that we measure, for example, how we continually invest in the sustainability and the upscaling of the projects that we have identified as part of our Gender Just Climate Solutions Program. And I think where that relates, again, back to the broader political leadership that Scotland can have is because this is the exact type of um, uh, advocacy that we are doing within, for example, the Loss and Damage Fund Board in the Green Climate Fund Board. It's about actually shifting those mechanisms to create windows for more simplified direct access to frontline communities. Um, and I think that the learnings from something like the Climate Justice Fund in what it is funding and the mechanisms and ways that it is doing it can actually serve as important lessons to the broader mechanisms, and I think that that, that will have a, a, an impact in moving us towards uh, more climate just finance. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Um, Mr. Wilson, just in, the, in terms of the report, I don't think this committee looked at it, but I believe the Climate and Justice Committee did, mm -hmm. but we'll look into that and see if there was a response to that report or the committee did any work on it. Um, just, just a question, because I, 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 the phrase you use, I think, in terms of what the the government was doing in terms of the climate targets, it said, um, to say what we honest about what it got wrong. Do we know what we got wrong? Do we know, is it in the general directions moving right the way, or is it other things that are... Um, in, in terms of policy, yeah. um, in terms of policy, I think there's, there's a, the best place to look to is the, the CCC, the Committee on Climate Change's advice to the Scottish Government, the series of, of bits of advice that the committee gave to the Scottish Government in terms of advice on achieving its targets from when they were set in 2019 until, well, and, and still to this day, they're, they're producing regular um, reports on that. I'm not an expert on, the, te on the, the technical detail, but I know that there was further things that had been suggested by them in terms of um, heating and buildings and in terms of agriculture and land use and in terms of transport and, and, and I'm sure other areas of policy. I think in terms of the sort of governance of it and essentially the failure of the law, right? I mean, how, why, 
why is it so easy to, 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 to put targets in law that can then be so easily missed and, and broken? And, and ultimately, the only consequence, as I understand it from the legislation, was that you can miss the target. And then all that means is the minister's got to go and say why they've missed the target and produce some plans to, to get back to the target. But we, we've seen that those plans to get back to the target have often not been robust enough at all. And so I think there actually needs to be a wider exercise um, perhaps as a parliament um, uh, rather than uh, as a government per se, about um, how such a piece of legislation um, could have such holes in it, as it were, to make sure that the new legislation, which uh, the stage one debate will be uh, later today, um, is much more robust and, and that targets aren't missed in future. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Mr Harvey. Um, okay, where do I begin? There's, there's, um I, I'd very happily offer a, a list of the reasons I think Scotland uh, has got it wrong, but I'll perhaps save that for the debate this afternoon on the, the new climate bill, which is finally an acknowledgement that we are years behind where we're supposed to be uh, on uh, re reducing emissions domestically. It relates a little bit, though, and I, I was going to start uh, with this theme, but I think it's been covered to a certain extent, so I won't, I won't go into it in too much detail. But... Um, uh, Bridget Burns said that uh, nothing about this transition is, is easy. If we go back to when Scotland first bought credibility, domestically and internationally, uh, at COP15 in 2009, it was done easily. It was done by just setting targets, uh, agreeing the destination without agreeing the steps that are needed to get there. That was the easy bit. Um, and I think uh, it... it Mr. Wilson is probably right to say that it, it, it's a little too early to ask for that honest self-reflection from the government, because if they gave it now, I think they would just say Parliament set too high a target and we didn't get anything wrong. So next year's COP, I think, is probably the time when they have to show we've got a new climate plan after the current legislation is passed uh, and try and show some credibility. But I wanted to link this to the issue of climate finance more broadly specifically in relation to Scotland's track record uh, in financing the energy sector. Scotland has been a fossil fuel producer for a long time. Scotland hosts not only the companies that continue to extract fossil fuels, but also the companies that finance that activity, despite the very clear signal from the, the UN and other agencies that new investment in fossil fuel cannot be justified. That's still happening. So what is the role and the responsibility that a country like Scotland, with that industry, both the energy and the finance parts of that industry, still operating? What can we do in that soft power sense? A little bit like you know, those early actions of, of setting targets and, and showing that we can earn credibility as a non-state party by setting targets. A little bit like the early work on both language and money behind the idea of climate justice and loss and damage. What can we do uh, in the space of saying that the fossil fuel finance industry is what needs to be challenged and changed if we're going to have a global economy that finances climate action uh, and does it justly? If, if I could uh, start on that, thank you for the, for the question. Um, I think it's really important that, that Scotland positions itself very carefully in, that, in the context like that you've described there in terms of what can we do and, and how can we move forward? I think it goes. It, it really talks to the tune of that just transition aspect. It's. It, I think what Scotland needs to to show very clearly, incredibly, is that it has a a clear plan um, and a framework that it will uh, adopt and, and implement um, around how it's going to move away from. The fossil fuel industry, and, and I guess it, it kind of like relates to the language of, of COP moving out or you know, phasing out or phasing down of of, um, of fossil fuels, and it needs to uh, articulate and, and put itself in, in, in the correct kind of uh, position there. Um, I think what we need to do is to connect this conversation around just transition with uh, with. Our, the public here in Scotland to show that we are really committed to doing this. At the moment, I, there isn't there isn't that kind of like connect as much as it should be, mm -hmm. um, it, and and I think it's, it's it's a challenging one because 
you can look at the transition aspect of that call, of that equation. Say this is a journey to net zero, but the just aspect of it is what needs to be unpacked in much more detail, and that I think is not clear at the moment. Um, how it's going to do that, what framework it's going to use. Um, is it just going to be about securing uh, skills and upskilling jobs or uh, upskilling of those who are going to be uh, affected by the closure of fo fossil fuel companies? But it also has to be about, uh, this, uh, about society, those who, who, who are going to be left with picking up the pieces. Um, not everyone will be able to uh, adapt to or, or buy electric vehicles. It's not within the means, for example. So, so what, is the, what is the approach? What is the inclusivity around the just part of the transition uh, conversation? I think, I think it needs to be properly debated and thought through, and these two aspects need to come together uh, and align much more clearly, because at the moment it just feels like a, a, a term. It's, it's a fancy term out there, and it will be at, at COP as well, but I think the, the, the padding around just transition needs to be better articulated. I would, I would just say, I mean, in, in the very near term, what we need to see is a, a reaffirmation of the Scottish Government's commitment um, presumption against uh, new uh, North Sea oil and gas licences in the energy strategy, energy and just transition strategy, which is very delayed and, and forthcoming, mm. I hope, very soon. Not quite sure why it's delayed. I don't know um, who does know why it's delayed. You're but anticipating my supplementary. Yeah. Um, and so, so um, at, and, and, and wouldn't it be nice if the Scottish Government could show the same courage that it showed on loss and damage um, as it could with fossil fuels and, and it was a very courageous thing to commit that money to loss and damage for many many years many countries in the global north had felt that uh, giving money to loss and damage would open the door to, to legal um, liabilities uh, and therefore Scotland really went out on a limb in making that commitment but they did it because it was the right thing to do and now all of a sudden loss and damage isn't as taboo as it was before and, and it's now something that there's a UN fund for um, and, and I think that the Scottish Government could show the same courage on, on fossil fuels and the just trans transition, be brave to, to, um, to commit, to continue to commit to no new licences, maybe be even more brave and support the calls for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty at the international level, be realistic about the fact that pretending there is a future for North Sea oil and gas is good for workers when it's not, because actually what's good for workers is a, is a reliable alternative in the form of renewables in the North East, and start to really own that progressive position on building that more prosperous future, which at the same time I think would help make the public case for the net zero transition in and of itself. And I mean, I, I would say that the, that would need to be done in partnership with the UK government. Um, and, and, uh, and yet the early signs, I suppose, of greater collaboration between this government here in, uh, in Edinburgh and the government in London are, are positive. And if that could be done in close collaboration with the UK government, then I think that would um, spell a good opportunity for Scotland. Given that uh, Ben Wilson has raised it, I'll maybe just ask sure. now to confirm one point before asking Bridget Barnes to, to, to speak. Um, the, the energy strategy and just transition plan, uh, and Professor Jaffrey said what we need is a clear plan. It is with government. It's waiting to be published. Uh, you know, if the government was in a position to publish that by COP29, by the time they go there, uh, they've got that plan. They've got the presumption against uh, new fossil fuel capacity being supported by the Scottish Government. Again, that's a symbolic position. That's about soft power because those licences aren't decided here. So it's within the, the scope of that kind of role that the Scottish Government has at COP. That would be a, an important step in rebuilding and restoring Scotland's credibility in this space. Absolutely. Um, and just, just quickly, um, to, to remind folks that COP28, one of the big agreements, as Professor Jaffrey mentioned before, was the agreement to transition away from fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And therefore, one of the things at COP29 that people will be asking, that the will be negotiated, is, is OK, how, how are we making sure that we are now uh, uh, transitioning away from fossil fuels? The Scottish Government need an answer to that question. Thank you. That's helpful. Uh, I wonder if uh, Bridget Burns want to add anything on this, this area as well. Yeah, maybe just two quick points. I, I fully agree with the comments that have already been made, and we are we are wholeheartedly advocating for countries to be stepping up as leaders in what is now a, a globally accepted position, in our opinion, that we have to shift away urgently from fossil fuels and, and wanting to see countries really being focused on not the if or the when, but the how, and how do you do this in a just way. Um, 
And I think that there is a lot of, uh, as far as I understand, in terms of public polling within uh, within Scotland, an opportunity for the country to be real leaders on this, uh, and and also thinking about what is the role of uh, who, how do we create government policies that invest in renewable energy over fossil fuel extraction, and who who is going to be the leading voice in this transition, and how is it maybe not the oil and gas industry? Uh, and, and so I think that these are really critical points to improving credibility uh, as a leader on this issue. And the one element I would add that feels really important from a global climate justice perspective, I wanted to point to the uh, a recent report that just came out in September uh, from the Secretary General on critical minerals. I think that this is actually a really critical piece of the climate justice aspect of when countries are thinking domestically about how they are shifting away from fossil fuels to invest in renewable energy to understand that any resource can be extracted to the point of exploitation and to the point of degradation in terms of environment. And that includes the green economy, as well as the current economy that we're in. Um, one of the huge findings that folks have been pointing to over the last few years, and where we're seeing in communities that we work with um, from Chile to uh, Zimbabwe, is you know we have communities that are sitting on lands filled with lithium and other critical transition minerals that if we don't take into account um, what it means to center human rights, to center the rights of indigenous peoples in this transition and have a, a, a justice approach to what does it mean as communities um, to transition, then we will do harm. And we, we should not have a transition to a green economy on the backs of uh, communities in the global south. So that feels really important um, to enter into this conversation and one that both how can Scotland be a leader on this, but also from a leader as a climate justice perspective in the same way that, we, that we've that we seen that political leadership on loss and damage is kind of leading the conversation on how to do this in a way um, that takes that reality of our critical minerals into account as well. That's a, a very important point. Well put, thank you. I think Professor you. Jaffrey wanted to come back in as Sorry. well. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Just, just, um, uh, just just making sense of the, the conversation, I think, around just transition, there, there are a couple of things that are, I think are really important to, to, to flag here. I think the, 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 um, the understanding of what just transition means is, um, is, is something I think we need to be mindful of. There's, there's the, the, the language that's used to describe just transition. A lot of, there's a lot of, uh, 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 there are a lot of organisations and stakeholders that just do not understand what this is all about, um, as well as what climate justice is all about. That, that's really important to try and cap capture here. But I think when we're talking about just transition, um, the big picture is, is looking at who's really benefiting from, that, from the just transition. Is it Global North or is it Global South? Because for us to transition will require dependency on uh, extractives, um, mining, minerals, the whole lot. Um, a, lot of the, 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 a lot of that is in the Global South. So on one hand, we will transition to green clean, but it could come at a significant social and environmental cost to the Global South. And I think this is something that we really need to be mindful of. Uh, in our in our day to day uh, business, so I think that that, that understanding of what just transition means um, is really important that that we get that right, and also what 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 climate and, and how how climate justice fits neatly within. Uh, we were talking a lot about uh, policy and government policies and so on. How does it fit within government departments in different parts of the world? Where is it aligned, and how can others actually adopt? principles and policies on climate justice and just transition, which government department does it sit in? Is it just somewhere outside or does it align squarely? So these are kind of like broader questions that I think we, that I think we need to be mindful of. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, are there any further questions from members? No, oh, I think that's exhausted our, 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 our questions this morning, but um, thank you so much. It's been really um, uh, an enjoyable um, session this morning and particularly thanks to
Bridget for getting up so early to come and join with us online from from New York, I believe. So um, uh, 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 that concludes the session this morning, and thank you very much for your attendance. And we now go into private session. Thank you. Thank you.